And when she was walking to the door, and I told her, don't close the door. And in that instant, the gun went off. This is Yolanda Saldivar, and is arguably one of the most hated people in the Latino community. And if you don't know, this woman has served 30 years of an entire life sentence with her first parole hearing coming up in March 2025. So what could this seemingly harmless old woman have done in order to garnish so much hate from an entire ethnic group? She is obsessive, greedy, manipulative, and evil. But what did she actually do? To answer that question, we need to start right back at the beginning with Selena Quintanilla. Selena Quintanilla Perez was born in Texas and entered the world at Freeport Community Hospital in Lake Jackson. Her parents were Marcela Ofelia Quintanilla and Abram Quintanilla, who was a former Mexican-American musician. Avram played in a band during the 1950s and 60s, blending early rock and roll tunes with traditional Mexican music. This unique fusion eventually came to be recognized as Tejano music. Therefore, Avram was one of the pioneers of this genre. He started his musical journey as a part of a group called Los Dinos in 1956. However, in the late 1960s, he departed from the group to take a break from music and focus on starting his own family. And that's when Selena was born, the youngest of three. There is Avram Quintanilla III, the eldest child, also known as A.B., who was a legend in his own right, but we'll, we'll get to that later. He was born on December 13th, 1963, following the middle child, Suzette Quintanilla, who was born on June 29th, 1967. By the time Selena was born in 1971, Avram and Marcela had to think fast and decide on a name because they were originally anticipating a boy. They had already settled on the name Mark Anthony. However, to their surprise, Selena was born. And little did they know that their little girl was about to change music and arguably the world forever. As Selena grew up, it became evident that she possessed something truly special. She had that X factor that people talk about but can't describe in words. She had inherited her father's musical talent and passion, and alongside her beauty, everyone believed she would be destined for greatness. And in 1981, at the age of 10, Selena took on the role as lead singer in their family band called Selena y los Dinos. Her brother A.B. played the bass guitar, while her sister Suzette, she played the drums. The group was started because Avram had pushed them to hone their musical abilities. This all happened all while Avram had decided to open his very first Tex-Mex restaurant in Lake Jackson, known as Papagayos. Interestingly enough, Selena y los Dinos' initial performance took place at the restaurant. It was a great environment. The kids would get to play their music and people would come from all around to listen. And of course, there was great Mexican food. But unfortunately, the restaurant faced financial difficulties and had to close its doors due to the impact of the 1980s oil surplus. It was so rough for the family that they had to declare bankruptcy and ended up being evicted from their home. Determined not to give up, they decided to move to Corpus Christi after Avram decided to become the band's full-time manager and began securing them gigs at weddings, fairs, quinceañeras, and local clubs just, just to make ends meet. However, growing up in Texas and primarily speaking English, Selena's father encouraged her to embrace her Mexican heritage and music career by singing in Spanish. Fast tracking to 1984, Selena y Los Dinos had a potential record deal with Freddie Records, but the label backed out last minute because they just thought they weren't ready yet. So they eventually signed a deal with Kara Records and released the album New Girl in Town, which caught GP Productions' attention and signed a one-year contract with Selena y Los Dinos. 
Selena went on to win the award for best female vocalist nine consecutive times. This broke records in a male dominated genre. She would focus on Tejano and Mexican songs and release the album Precious in 1987. This album went on to sell 20,000 units in Texas alone. I don't know how old some of you are, but some of you don't realize how big of a deal this is. Yes, on Spotify, some of your favorite artists have like a million listens on a single song alone. However, back in those days, you had to line up outside of a store, whether it was cold, raining, snowing, and you would do this for hours just for the possibility of buying the tape cassette or CD, whatever it was at the time. And they were like 15 bucks a pop. So this was a big deal. Following the release of that album, AB, Selena's brother, ended up meeting a musician by the name of Chris Perez, and they developed a friendship. Chris auditioned as a fill-in guitarist for the band and impressed everyone during his interview. And AB loved Chris, in fact, so much that he persuaded Abram to hire him as a full-time guitarist. And to be frank, Avram just didn't like Chris as he came from a rock background and a band that played exclusively American music. However, AB assured him that Chris would just adapt. And by 1989, the word began to spread about the band. They were landing enough gigs to make it work, pay the bills, and get by. And this is when they received a call from Capitol Records through their parent company, EMI. The president of EMI, Jose Bajar, offered them a contract with the label. However, there was a catch. EMI wanted Selena and the band to record and perform together, but they made it clear that they wanted Selena and not the rest of them. Selena's siblings were still welcome to perform and record with her, but the contract was exclusively between Selena and Capitol Records. The record label wanted her to be their first Latin artist. And even though she didn't want to overshadow the rest of the band, Selena understood that they would still be performing and recording together, but she would just be the main focus. I mean, it was a family band after all. So they ended up accepting the deal with Capitol Records. Now the label saw Selena as the next big thing and released her first solo album under EMI titled Selena. It even made its place on the Billboard charts after a successful debut. She had just gone from being a local talent to gaining national recognition. And with all the attention, it lifted her family from tough times. I mean, it was a collective effort, but her name was the driving force. But despite her youth, she was now in the public eye, particularly in the Latin community. Selena's teenage years were unlike most. She was lacking typical coming of age moments at this point. And by this time she was an adult, she was 19 years old. During a vacation to Mexico, Chris Perez, the guitarist, developed feelings for Selena. This unspoken connection had been brewing while they worked and played music together. And one day, they found themselves alone at a pizza hut. And that's when Chris decided to tell her how he felt. And to his surprise, Selena felt the same way. However, this love faced obstacles. Selena's dad didn't particularly like Chris because of his background. And because he was a rocker, their relationship would be seen as disrespectful and forbidden. But despite the challenges, they couldn't deny their love for each other. They started seeing each other secretly, sneaking around whenever possible. And eventually, their secret would come to light. Selena's older sister, Suzette, eventually discovered their secret and immediately informed Abram. He confronted Chris and kicked him off the tour bus, forbidding any relationship with his daughters. However, despite Chris being out of the band, Selena and Chris continued to see each other. This caused even more chaos within the family, and tensions rose. Abram would even refer to Chris as cancer to the family. In 1990, Selena's touring and success was growing rapidly. Her fan base was multiplying, and although she hadn't reached superstar status yet, she was well on her way. And this is where we meet Yolanda Saldivar. She had started reaching out to Abram in order to start a fan club for Selena centered around Corpus Christi. So for some of you youngins, back in the day, every celebrity had a fan club. You could sign up and pay a monthly subscription, I believe. You would get shirts, souvenirs, and tour dates all ahead of time. And ultimately, you were helping your favorite artists get ahead. Yolanda approached Abram and had revealed that she was Selena's biggest fan. She had attended a concert with her niece in San Antonio, Texas, and instantly became a huge fan. But after the show, she noticed that Selena and the band didn't have any souvenirs for anybody. And that's why Yolanda wanted to help create something, something fans could be part of. 
And after leaving numerous voicemails, Avran finally returned her call. He gave her the go-ahead and the green light to start the official Selena fan club. She had organized and advertised, and within a short time, she had gathered 1,500 members in the area alone. In 1991, Yolanda became more involved in Selena's career, working closely with the family. Selena appreciated Yolanda's help, especially connecting her with her fans. Yolanda's impact was significant, and everyone knew who she was. And on April 2nd, 1992, after enduring the ups and downs of their relationship, Selena and Chris decided to elope. It was Selena's and Chris's way to force Abraham to accept their relationship. But even then, they decided to keep it a secret. But it was only a matter of time before Abram would find out. News and radio stations were reporting that Selena had gotten married to Chris, and once again, Abram was the last to find out. As Selena's career continued to soar, her fan club led by Yolanda grew to over 8,000 members. Yolanda at this time decided to quit her full-time job as a nurse and dedicate herself to running Selena's fan club. By January 1994, Selena had gained recognition for her costume designs and she was even given the nickname the Mexican Madonna. Recognizing that she would have success in the fashion industry, the team decided to open boutiques under Selena's name. Yolanda was offered the opportunity to run the boutiques as the rest of the team would be busy and focused on the tour. And on March 1st, 1994, Selena won her first Grammy for Best American Mexican Album. And in the same year, Selena became the official face of Coca-Cola, solidifying her status as a star. Her dreams were finally coming true, and she was reaching the pinnacle of stardom. And in September of that same year, Selena officially appointed Yolanda as her registered agent in San Antonio. This meant that Yolanda could sign on behalf of Selena for anything related to the fan club, and she had access to the bank accounts. Yolanda at this point moved closer to Corpus Christi to be closer to Selena. Yolanda would go above and beyond her designated job. She lived in a constant state of just wanting to help and impress Selena. But in January of 1995, Selena's cousin, Deborah Ramirez, was hired to work in one of the boutiques. Selena had plans to expand the boutiques into Mexico and wanted to hire more staff. However, within a week, Deborah decided to quit. She felt everything was insanely unorganized in the boutiques, missing receipts. And when she tried to address these issues with Yolanda, she would just tell her to mind her own business. In March of 1995, fan club members started reaching out to Abran, complaining that they had signed up for the fan club, but didn't receive anything. It was as if they were being completely ignored. And of course, this raised suspicions, and Avram decided to gather some people and look into the matter. And as they delved deeper, they discovered some disturbing things happening behind their backs. Checks were being forged and money was being embezzled. And this was, of course, heartbreaking, especially considering the fact that this was all being done by Yolanda. Selena's number one fan that they had welcomed into their family had gone behind their back. Avran, Selena, and Suzette decided to confront Yolanda about the stolen money. They just couldn't believe that she would betray them, especially after everything they had done for her. And the conversation ended with Avram having to make the difficult decision to fire Yolanda. However, cutting off all contact proved to be a challenging thing to do. You see, Yolanda played a huge role in their business, and they needed financial documents and help with transferring things. And this is what led to the tragic situation that occurred on March 31st, 1995. Now police are negotiating with her by telephone. She has a small handgun to her head, and that's the way things are at this hour. Again, they're trying to negotiate with her and have her surrender to police, but so far, that's not happening. On that day, Avran received a phone call saying that someone had attacked Selena. He rushed to the scene to find that the attacker had been cornered in a car in a hotel parking lot. They needed his help to identify the person. And it was at that moment where Avran realized that the attacker was none other than Yolanda. She was sitting in a truck surrounded by police, holding a gun to her own head. What had happened is that earlier that morning, Selena agreed to meet Yolanda alone to retrieve the financial documents they needed. They were to meet at the Days Inn Motel in Corpus Christi. And when Selena arrived at the motel that morning, Yolanda confided in Selena that she had been essayed in Mexico. 
Selena was devastated, even though this woman had just gone behind her back and immediately took Yolanda to the ER. However, the hospital turned them away, stating that they couldn't examine Yolanda since the assault had happened in another country. Selena ended up driving Yolanda back to the Days Inn Motel, and before parting ways, she brought up the financial records she had come for. And it was at that moment Selena decided to bid her farewell. She said, Okay, Yolanda. It's time to say goodbye, and this is it. But Yolanda wasn't ready to let go. Selena watched in shock as Yolanda pulled out a gun and pointed it directly at her. And Selena tried to run, but Yolanda shot her right in the back, severing an artery. Selena collapsed in the hotel lobby, and an employee called 911. And as the police arrived at the scene, Yolanda made her way back to the truck. And that's where the police had cornered her, right in the parking lot. This led to a 10-hour standoff where Yolanda sat in the truck holding the gun to her head. And finally, at 9.30 p.m. at night, 32-year-old Yolanda Saldivar surrendered to the police and Avram identified her. Responders rushed Selena to the hospital, but unfortunately there was nothing that they could do. And Selena passed away at 1.05 p.m due to severe blood loss. Fans immediately gathered around the Days in Motel, weeping and crying and playing Selena songs. Man, I remember the feeling of finding out when Selena had passed and I was like five or six. And it's so hard to explain this feeling because I never met Selena and I was five years old before I really understood the impact that she had on the world. But even at that age, I still knew it was a huge loss to the Latino community. On April 1st, 1995, a vigil took place at the Bayfront Plaza in Corpus Christi with nearly 3,000 fans in attendance. Following the vigil, an open viewing was organized and an astonishing 30 to 40,000 fans came to pay their respects. And additionally, 78,000 people signed a book of condolences for Selena. And during this viewing, no photography or video was allowed. And Selena's funeral was privately held and attended by 600 guests. She was laid to rest at the Seaside Memorial Park in Corpus Christi. And in 1995, the trial began for the state versus Yolanda. The trial, of course, received widespread coverage. The defense argued that the shooting was accidental, claiming that Yolanda had hit Selena while trying to take her own life. However, the prosecution pointed out that Yolanda was a trained nurse and failed to call 911 or provide any help to Selena. Also, Selena was shot in the back which makes it difficult to argue that it was an accident at all, especially considering the fact that a hotel staff member witnessed Yolanda chasing down Selena with the gun. During the trial, it was revealed that Yolanda was using Selena's American Express card for her own personal expenses, such as renting luxury cars, dining out, and buying cell phones and electronics. And it came to light that she had embezzled over $60,000 using forged checks from the fan club. Just to put this in perspective, this is the equivalent of $120,000 today. And on October 23rd, 1995, Yolanda was found guilty and charged with the murder of Selena Quintanilla. She was sentenced to life with the possibility of parole in March 2025. So where does this leave us now? And what has come of Yolanda? After so many years, I think it's time to set the story straight. I was scared. I was frightened. She's just a person you can't believe. I knew her secrets. And I think that people deserve to, to know the truth. If you haven't put this together already, Yolanda Saldivar is releasing an interview through Oxygen True Crime, which is due to release today. She says she has secrets and things that the fans deserve to know at this point. However, it's been 30 years and time and time again, she's shown that she comes up with these big claims and yet nothing comes of it. She claimed that Selena had been cheating on Chris with some doctor at some point. She said she had letters that could prove this, but yet the letters just never saw the light of day. And I think it's important to remember that regardless of whatever Yolanda has to say, it doesn't bring Selena back. And it doesn't take away the fact that she took a life. And the fact that she's trying to change the narrative, saying that she was scared and that she's innocent and it was an accident, only points at the fact that she has no remorse for what she did. Nobody should be giving Yolanda any platform to speak a bunch of lies. And for that reason, I will not be watching the interview. But I want to know your thoughts. Will you be watching the interview with Yolanda Saldivar? Leave it in the comments below. With that said, hit the like, subscribe, and the bell as it helps me out a lot. So until next time, stay safe. 
and I will see you when the lights go out.